All right, so we're back on the Moonlight Graham Show with Greg Bruner. Greg, thank you for joining us in studio on this snowy Iowa day. Yeah, no, no, thank you for having me. Um, appreciate you kind of adjusting the schedule a little bit to, to accommodate the kids getting their Christmas presents, uh, <laughs> or burning, or paying all that, playing with all that money they got for Christmas. So, so you know, the guy that connects us is Jack Brownlee. Jack Brownlee puts us in contact. What's your best Jack Brownlee story? <laughs> Oh, that's a dangerous, uh, dangerous situation. This man. is a dangerous podcast. Yeah, right? yeah. So I still remember the times. I, I wrote it on a Twitter yesterday just to mess with him a little bit. So um, Jack played played spot minutes for us, um, but uh, he was essential. He was great because yep. after Pierre Pierce, yeah, Jack started yep. playing more minutes. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And the thing I really liked about Jack is that um, he never backed down from Horner. So they would fight every single day in practice, and it, it was just fun for me to watch because I mean that's the mentality that we had. I mean. There was fights all the time in our practice. I mean, it was never full blown fist fights or anything like that. But there was a lot of shoving matches, yelling at each other, and that's the way. I mean, it's a brotherhood, and that's the way it should be. So, and Jack is ultra competitive. Jeff's ultra competitive. They never back down, and they're like brothers. And it was it was fun to watch. But one of my best stories is um, we play Ohio State. So Jack always played those spot minutes for us in key spots, and he always got put in right before the first uh, the first half ended. And back to back years, he hit corner threes against Ohio State. And I just remember Thad Mata just walking up the the, the tunnel, just who the f is this guy? How does he always kill us? How no one we can't guard him? What what is going on here? And just screaming. And and Jack's swag. I mean, his walk goes from just normal Jack to like just his whole shoulders moving oh, back yeah. and forth. So it, it was just fun to watch because I mean, he made some big shots for us. What's funny about that is if the other head coach is saying who is this guy. Yeah. It means you weren't on the scouting report. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and Jack, I mean, Jack was cold blooded. He 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 didn't care. He, I mean, if, I mean, he would come in and I mean, his his he could score, so he's gonna shoot. He's he's uh, he's shoot first, ask questions later. So I mean, I, 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 I appreciated that. So yeah. So during those years, obviously, you played at Iowa from. 2002 through 2006 under Steve Alford. Alford's back in the news right now. He just got let go from UCLA. What was your first impression of Steve Alford? You know, I I, I enjoyed Steve, um, and I would say that a lot of players that played for him really liked him when we played for him. Um, it was he did whatever he could to make sure that we had everything that we could. Um, he made the best environment for us possible. Like when we were when in, in that in that structure of playing, you know. Um, Every coach you're gonna have trials and tribulations for. I mean, you're gonna have your ups and downs. You know, he's a Bob Knight coach. He went. Th- we went through a lot during those four years. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not gonna get down into the details and everything like that. But it was a trying couple four years because we had a lot of outside influences that came in and kind of took away the spotlight of what. I mean, we had a very good team, right? Um, and we had a, a a team that was all Iowa guys. I mean, we had Eric Hansen and Doug Thomas. But the majority of the rest of the guys were Iowa guys, and 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 to to do what we did with Iowa guys was it was something special. It didn't end well. Um, it didn't end the way it was supposed to. Uh, I think that we had the team to make a deep run, um, but you know I, I I never had anything to complain about with Alford. Uh, he 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 backed me up. He 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 was tough to play for at times, like I said. But uh, what coach isn't? Um, right. Um, you know you're 18 to to 23 years old and you're the king of the world. And when people tell you you're not doing things right, it's never easy to hear, but he did a good job of trying to keep us in balance and, and, and make sure that we, we got better. And I feel like we got better over those four years. Did you ever beat Alfred in a shooting contest? So, uh, I have a couple fun stories about that. I, we, they, they, we had one game, um, where we played, it was, uh, I think it was Lansing, BJ and Alford and we played three on three. I don't I think it was Horner, myself and Pierre. So or, Lansing, Greg, Greg Lansing, Lansing, who's yeah. now at Indiana state. Yep, He was a good basketball player too. Oh, yeah. uh, and He's Brian, from Harlan. I yep, think. Yep. And then Brian Jones was a really good basketball too. Okay. You and I, so, I mean, we had talented coaches too. And I, I swear to this story, something happened or I, somebody got hit or something like that. And it never happened ever again. Cause it was just one of those moments that I think we, it was like the last time they ever played three on three against any of the guys. Cause uh-huh. it, get, it gets heated. I mean, we don't want to lose either. They don't want to lose. And, and there's respect there. So. Yeah. Jack told a story about that three on three game when he was red shirting yeah. and it was Jack Pierre and then someone else against Alford and the coaches every day. Yeah. And he said, watching Alford and Pierre go one on one was incredible to watch. Yeah. So I remember one time I up faked and I got him with it was luckily it wasn't my elbow it was more my bicep I got Alfred under the jaw and uh, he wasn't happy about that so and it was it wasn't an accident um, and it was just one of those situations where 
I, he's just ultra competitive. I mean, he he wants to win everything, and 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 it sucks kind of how it happened at UCLA because he is a guy that wants to win, and he he, he knows how to win. It's just it's that's a tough place to coach. Um, and the environment there is completely different. He had a great thing in New Mexico. Mexico. I thought he was building some things at Iowa. Um, it was just he never really got into that that comfort zone here in, in the state of Iowa. And that was it's tough. I mean, it's tough to it's tough to coach at Iowa too. Yeah. I mean, it would be a dream get job for me. Um, because I'm Iowa born, and I it's just it would be like I'm Hawkeye raised, and it's just one of those situations. But it would be tough for somebody on the outside to come in. Fran, I think Fran's brought that fire in. Oh, no doubt he's brought fire to the yeah. program. So you, you talked that you're Iowa born, born and raised in Charles City, Iowa, and you had some good high school basketball teams. There was a Rotting House kid yeah. at Charles City when you were there. Who I think did he go out to Wyoming and yeah. play out there? Yep, and- he played in Wyoming. Yep, very, 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 very talented. It was it was fun to play against him. I mean, he, that was the reason I made huge strides because I remember as a freshman I played him. It was like 11 zero him. And then sophomore year, it was like 11-2 him. And then junior year, it was like 11-5. And then my senior year, you'd come back, and we'd be like 11-9. And then finally, my freshman year of college, I beat him. And then we never played again. <laughs> I wasn't getting back into that one. So, yeah. So, Charles City had two Division One guys. Yep. Rotting House was class of 2000. You were class of 2001. 2002. Or you were 2002. And you guys both played on those Martin Brothers teams. Yep, yep. And so, um, how did you – what were those Martin Brothers teams back – in the early 2000s like oh it was great um i mean that was where when aau was i think was at its prime i mean now it's just gotten into a big racket in my opinion uh, a lot of money being thrown around that you know the thing that um the martin brothers program is is um obviously the the company martin brothers does an amazing job they sponsor everything that's that's a unique environment in this state um and our team was great i mean we had i think my class itself i can't remember how many division one athletes or basketball players we had in it I would love to go down the list sometime again. We did it one time. It was over twenty. It's like over twenty-five Division One basketball players out of the state of Iowa. Amazing that year. And so we actually um, we competed on national championships. Uh, we got second in the nineteens when we were seventeen. Uh, we got third in the seven uh, our seventeen division. We won multiple tournaments, and our team was split. We didn't have Haluska. We didn't have so the the coaches association built a team, and we had Martin Brothers and Jeff and I were on the Martin Brothers team, and we had I think. Josh Powell, Ben Jacobs, and Nate Funk, um, uh, Mike Henderson, Carl, uh, Carlton didn't even play with us much. So we had a, a for Sean McGee. I'm trying to think through everybody. I mean, I was I was a four or five. Jared Holman played with us too. Yep. Um, imagine Jared Holman and myself as a four or five. <laughs> I was two fifty five in high school. I mean, he was two sixty in high school. Yeah, big and, Remsen boy. It, yeah. So that was we 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 beat a lot of people. There's nothing better than walking onto a court with you know. A New York, a Bronx, New York team, and they're just looking at us like we're gonna, we're gonna destroy these guys, and we beat them by forty. Right, and it was fun. Well, we were just talking about that with Adam Veet, and Adam Veet was on the podcast, and he never played on Martin Brothers, and him, Jared Jostin, mm-hmm. Brooks McCowan, those guys were all Division One guys at U and I, and they didn't make the cut at Martin Brothers, just to show how good of a team yep. Martin Brothers had at that time. They didn't make either of those teams, and they had to create their own team, and they were all Division One guys. Yep. Yep. So I, I actually played with Brooks and V. I think when I was, uh, I would have been a freshman. We made a team, and then we beat. Uh, I think Dan Deary had a team with Horner, Drew Shep, and a really good team. And Drew we, Shep from yeah, Clear Lake. Yeah, we ended up beating them in state uh, state fifteen under championships, and then we went to nationals. And I remember playing in nationals with it was this is all just a Northeast Iowa sec team, and uh, we played against Rashad McCants. And he looked the exact same at 15. <laughs> and I just remember him going up and dunking from like two steps in from the free throw line at 15 years old. And we're like, well, wow, this is a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. Is Rashad McCants the best guy you ran up against in those uh, AAU oh, teams? Oh, no. I played against Armari, um, uh, Carmelo. Armari uh, Stoudemire? Yeah. I, uh, I played. So I got to play in the Michael Jordan game. So I got to play. I guarded Carmelo straight for a week. Um, uh, I played with Amari Stoudemire at uh, the Nike um and that was fun uh, when you're playing next to him i i played the two uh at the nike game at nike camp and i had the best tournament of my life and that was where i kind of skyrocketed up in that um and got me into the jordan game um and it was i mean it, it helps when you play with amari stoudemire so that, that's that's one of the big things i think we had like 27 dunks in one game between yusuf baker myself and amari stoudemire it was it was fun how do you guard carmelo uh you spin around in circles a lot. Um, I mean, because 
I think in an All Star game he took twenty six shots. Um, and yeah, he's he, gonna put them up. Oh, he doesn't. Yeah, in practice. I mean, it was fun. It was a learning experience. Like I said, I, at that time I was, uh, I went from in high school like six six one hundred and seventy five pounds to six seven to I graduated high school at like two fifty eight, um, and then I actually trimmed down a little bit in college. I got down to two fifty my first two years because I played a three and I graduated. I played my last two years. I probably played at two sixty two um, mm-hmm. in college and. I don't know why they always had me at 245, but I was always I was heavy. But yeah, Carmelo, um, he 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 was that just the combinations that he could throw together, like he and his change of angle was so hard, especially at my size. Was trying to stay with that, and I mean he's a uh, the best player in college basketball right. as a freshman, and uh, you can see it. Um, very very skilled. Yeah, I think that's probably an understatement, right? Yeah. Carmelo is probably one of the best in our generation, the best offensive players we've ever seen. Best team player? I don't no, know. No, not so much there. <laughs> right. So going back to your Charles City days, because yep. we, we talked about Rodding House, who was a Division One guy, yourself, you're playing in the Michael Jordan game, and yet Charles City never makes the state tournament. Yeah. it was. Uh, How does this happen? So we go... My sophomore year, in my opinion, we were probably one of the better teams in the state. Um, we go twenty and two. Uh, my first our first game of the year, Riding House spouts off. We're going, we're going undefeated, and we go to Osage, uh, and they have a really good football team. Um, just bunch just, of physical guys, just a bunch of freak, freak athletes. And David goes like two for fifteen, two for nineteen, or something like that. Just has a horrific game, and it happens. You know what I mean? And we end up losing at, at a buzzer, and then we run off a bunch of games in a row, and then David gets. They say he has mono, and then we go play Olwine, which is another good team. Um, and uh, we end up losing Olwine at home. Uh, he doesn't play. We end up losing by one or two. So we lost two games by like three or four points or something like this. That Olwine team, did that have Eric Sanders no, on uh, it? That was a couple years later he okay. played. But the Olwine team had a pretty good team. Um, and, and so we lose to Olwine at home in a regular season. So then last game of the year, we go play against New Hampton, who won a 3A state championship that year. We beat New Hampton by like 45 points at New Hampton. Um, and then – we smack Owen in the first round of the playoffs, and we go to the district finals. We get upset by New Hampton in double overtime, um, and then they end up losing to Wakan, who goes to the state tournament. We held Wakan to seven points a half, <laughs> and I had two of them because I tipped the ball in. I still remember it. And Wakan ends up winning the, one of the games in the state tournament too. And it was just one of those freak things that, like, everything went wrong and, mm-hmm. and it it was tough my sophomore year. and my junior and senior years i mean uh, we played against uh four city in the sub state final um four city had a really good team uh rob they had three division one athletes um and we ended up losing by four or five against them and then uh we ended up losing against Owine uh my senior year uh and my uh, i think northeast iowa conference had four teams in the top 10 okay um and Owine, us, our, myself, uh, Waverly was number one, our team, Owine, and I think Cresco was pretty good. I can't remember the back going back that far. What's interesting about that is I talked about the same thing with Adam Holuska. Yeah. Because yourself had a long professional career. Adam Holuska, you know, was on NBA rosters and played overseas. Yep. Two of the greatest athletes in the state of Iowa's history. Even Jeff Horner only made the state tournament once, and yeah. so you had unbelievable Iowa guys on that Iowa team, but there was only one state tournament among the three of you. Yeah, yep, and to be honest with you, uh, one of the funny things is, is like I think you might have been the next tallest guy on my team. <laughs> like, it went me, so I... I'm a pretty good-sized yeah, guy, yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't think we had anybody above six one after me, mm-hmm. um, uh, after my senior year, that is. Um, and at, at my size, like, when we got pressed, I brought the ball up um because it was i was the one that could handle the right. pressure and the size so we, i mean our team was okay um but still we should have we, we should have gone to the state championship uh or excuse me the state tournament uh it's just one of those things that didn't happen i didn't i know i didn't play very well the last game against all wine it was i think i was like four for 16 from the free throw line or something <laughs> like that and we lose by three or some ridiculous thing so was there ever in a thought to go anywhere else but iowa um I, no, I, I like I said, I was I, Iowa was the always the number one thing. They didn't actually come recruit me at all until after my sophomore year, um, going into my junior year. I I, I I had a really good junior summer, and that's when they started to um, to, to really take interest in me. Um, I took a visit to Ohio State, or oh, geez, uh, Iowa State, um, and just never really liked the fit. You say she wasn't my style of coach. Mm-hmm. Good coach. I'm not saying anything against him. But just wasn't my style of coach. Um, so my first offer was Wisconsin, 
and uh, it was Soderberg. It was a mover blocker system. I, I didn't take it because I was going to be a blocker, and I, I'm more of a mover. I wanted to <laughs> score. And and then after I committed to Iowa, that's when like the Dukes and North Carolinas and things like that. I started getting a lot of lot of um, just stuff from a verbal commitment. Um, a lot of interest there. And then I had a really big breakout summer in my junior year, and it was just one of those things where um, I didn't think I was going to have a high, like a highly. I was six seven, white kid from Charles City, Iowa, right. farmer as a dad, like. I didn't really think I was going to have a big professional career. So I was like, you know what? If I, I'm, I'm smart, I'm, I'm, a, I'm intelligent, I get good grades, I work hard in school, I'm going to have a good job afterwards. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll use that key as a key driver and to trying to get myself You were thinking job. that already yeah. in high school, huh? Yeah, and, I, and I, I just didn't think I would have a 10-year professional career. I didn't know anything about Europe. Nobody dreams about going to play in Europe. Right. And, then, um, and then you see the check that they write you your first year, you're like, okay, I'll go play in Europe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was just one of those things where... I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, um, but I knew that I was born and raised a Hawkeye, um, and it would be one of the proudest moments of my life to put that across my chest. So, Ooh. Who was the most impressive coach that recruited you? Um, so probably Roy. Um, I can't remember if Roy was at Kansas or if he was – he was at Kansas when he started recruiting me, and then he went to North Carolina. Um, yeah, it was probably Roy because I actually went to basketball. So I grew up a Kansas fan because Rafe fans too. Of course. So I was a, um, I won a Kansas fan. Um, and then Callison and uh, Heinrich won't go there. So it's even more interesting now. Um, but I remember going to basketball camp there and it was Paul Pierce, Nick, uh, all those guys were there. And I was like, it was when I was like spouting up too. It was my going into my freshman year. I wore size 15 shoes. I had huge hands. I was <laughs> playing with the, 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 the 15 year olds. And 14 year olds, and then they moved me up to the varsity, and I'm still doing a hold of my own. And they, they're like, I remember Paul Pierce was like, I was shooting free throws in, in the middle of the game. He like stops the game, he comes up, puts his feet next to me, and he goes, Oh, this one's gonna get big. So <laughs> he's like joking around with me on that way. And then a little bit after that, I started getting some recruiting stuff from them, and it, it was it was just kind of a fun experience. I so. feel like Roy Williams could sell about anything. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, because he, I, he, I know he was at North Carolina when I started at at Iowa, um, because all my buddies went there. So I was friends with um, uh, uh Sean May, Rashawn McCants, um. Raymond Felton, all those guys. Those guys so, won it. Yeah, they had a great yeah, team. Yeah, yeah, those are the guys that we played against every single time at um, uh, in AAU circuits. And then JJ Reddick was a really close friend of mine too. So he was. I don't know if he and Shavlik didn't get along very well, but he was trying to. He was in my ear a little bit too, and and it would have been fun. So I mean, any of those would have been fun. But I, like I said, it it worked out well. I did what I did. I stayed. I went. I wanted to play at Iowa. That's that would have been a dream of mine, and it was a dream of mine. And. It was probably the best choice I could have made. Yeah, born and raised a Hawkeye, and you have four great years there. You you essentially start for four years, become the all time leading rebounder in the University of Iowa's history. You talked about it your first couple of years at Iowa. You played the three, yet you still are the all time leading rebounder. I mean, for a for a program that's had you know the Don Nelsons and the yep. AC Earls, that's saying something. Yeah, it was it was one of those things. I I didn't even know about it really at all until like halfway through my senior year they pulled me aside they're like hey keep going you're gonna get the record i'm like what are you talking about they're like the rebound record i'm like there's a rebound record? yeah <laughs> yeah that's basically what it was and and they said you know nobody in the history of university of iowa's ever had a thousand rebounds and i'm like oh and i think there was only 10 at the time in the history of the big 10 and i'm like well that's my number i'm shooting for i don't care about the record i want a thousand and and i have uh going into my senior it was uh going into the big 10 championship game uh, excuse me, Big Ten Championship tournament, excuse me, and I have an offer um, against Minnesota. And I get my if I get my stripes, then I I, I break a thousand because I end with nine ninety. Yep. Or if we don't get beat by Northwestern, Northwestern State, State yeah. I I'd probably break the thousand and would have been the the tw like tenth or tenth at that time, tenth or eleventh in the history of the Big Ten um, with a thousand rebounds. Who or where was a favorite place to go play in the Big Ten? Um. I like crowds. Like when you're having seventeen thousand people chanting Rogaine at you, there's nothing more fun. Like I enjoy playing at Champagne. Um, uh, Michigan State was a because Champagne at that time. That's when yeah. Bill Self was there. Uh, yeah, that was when they had D Brown, Darren right. Rogers, Lutherhead, Roger Powell, James Augustine. They, I mean, our squads matched up absolutely perfect together. Like we, it was just going to be an epic battle, and. Uh, um, it was just going there was going to be a fight. It was like I got to play against Roger Powell, who played a very similar game to me. He's a little bit more outside oriented, 
Um, and then uh, Nick Smith was <laughs> – I don't even want to get in that conversation. Uh, yeah, they just had a very good team that was just fun to play against. And um, going into Michigan State was a buzzsaw. Um, you saw it this year when they played there. Anytime, yeah. like, the whistles just get swallowed. Um, it's it's my style of basketball, but it's it, it, when you get up there, you're just going to – it's a football game. Oh, this year was so physical yeah. then. And that's just the way it is with Izzo. Yep. Yep. Like, that's the way his teams roll. And that's why – I mean, if you look back at my stat lines against Michigan State – the refs let things go when you play that game, and that's my style of basketball, and that's what's fun for me. So that's why I usually have better games against like a Michigan State team, especially because Izzo was still pissed. I, it, one of the best conversations I had with him was walking down the tunnel. It was my senior year um, we, when we got blasted at, at, at the Breslin Center, and then we came back, and we beat them by, handily at home. Um, and it was when people were flexing, the dunks, all that stuff, because uh, it was a p- pretty big rivalry. And Izzo, we were walking up the tunnel, he's like, I, and I'm not going to say the exact words, but there's a lot of four letter words in there. I can't believe you didn't let me recruit you and let me sign it. <laughs> Cause like I would have been a great key to that team. Cause they were missing a, a, a solid four man. And it would have been, it would have been a, it would have been a good team to play for. Cause that's my style of basketball. But like I said, uh, to put on, I just wouldn't look good in that green. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're better of a black and gold yeah. guy, black, <laughs> you know, the, the rugged look. Yeah. So you mentioned 17,000 fans chanting Rogaine at you. <laughs> You know, that's got to be tough for a 20-year-old 20 year old kid. I never had the receding hairline. Mine kind of sprinted. Um, I don't, <laughs> I, and I still say to this day, it was when Craig Neal came. That's where it all went downhill for me. I, and, I, and I enjoyed Craig when he coached us. He, was, he, he, did, he did a good job. But it was just one of those things that, you know, I, I wasn't follically blessed, I guess. <laughs> and uh, my wife would not even know what to do if, if I had hair. Because uh, she's never seen me with hair. So that's probably a good thing. I was joking a couple of years ago. Remember Luke Kennard for Duke? Yeah. Luke yeah. Kennard, the lefty for Duke. He was losing his hair yeah. in college. And yeah. he had the comb over going. <laughs> and then sure enough, when he gets to the NBA, he had the Brian Urlacher surgery. Yep. Now he's got hair again. Oh, I got to look at that thing then. No. I've been following Luke Kennard. All right. Okay. I I bet you LeBron's done it too because he's suddenly got a hair now. Yeah. Can LeBron not hire the right doctor? Because it always, (laughs) it like comes and goes, I feel like, with him. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I wouldn't even know what to do. I, it's you know I spend eighteen dollars a year, and that's just a pack of razors, and I shave my head three times a week. When I was in Europe, it was like maybe twice a week because I didn't really care. Um, but uh, now I'm back home. I you look good. Yeah, I, I think you, the bald you. look is a good thank look you, for you. you. So the people sometimes they think I'm Shrek, but outside of that, it's <laughs> yeah. Well, we talk about uh, when we had Aluska on. We talked about that Northwestern State game, yep. and what was interesting about that conversation is he said that. It's looked at as a big upset, of course, because of the seeds. Yeah. But his point was Northwestern State had a team, had oh. a really good team, and that was a tough matchup for you guys. Yeah, I mean, it, it was all athletes. Um, they didn't really have a style. Like we are, we were the best team. We were the best defensive team in the nation. Um, and uh, it, it, especially when we could identify a style that they play, because then we could lock in and we could play. We could manipulate our defense. We, we obviously we were three point line in. Um, we protected that. And when you have a shot blocker like Eric Hansen, and yep. like, and I was the rotate guy, so I would always help make them shoot early, and he could block everything. And then I could rotate back out and clean up the rebounds. So we had a very, very good system, and we had big, big physical guards. And the difference is, is they don't play a style; they play all one on one. And we ran into the same problem um, against uh, uh, Iowa State uh, that my that year also because it was a similar style. It was just a lot of transition a lot of one-on-one there was no no sets you couldn't read you couldn't right. just you couldn't see the action before it happened so you couldn't get yourself in good spots and, and we had him down 16 with six minutes left and we took out i mean jeff adam and i all played 30 plus minutes 33 plus minutes a game and that was probably the one thing that i was most disappointed out is that um we all three came out of the game with about six minutes left and our, our league goes from 16 to six in about a minute and a half and when you get into that, that's a buzzsaw to come back into and try to, to, to turn that around. Yeah. We finally got it going. We got it turned around. And it was this, God, I, I've always thought, like, what the difference was. I mean, what that season would have been looked at and viewed at as in the history books of Iowa basketball if that shot doesn't go in or if the two-point goes in instead of the three-pointer. Like, right, because you had a great year, yeah. second in the Big Ten, 25-8 and eight going into that game. Yeah. You know, should have won. I mean, we should have got the Big Ten championship and the Big Ten tournament championship. We had 
two two tough, dumb losses on the road late in the season to subpar teams. I mean, it's hard to go in any place yeah. and win the Big Ten. And we were 17-0 at home. Um, we did what we needed to do. Um, it was just uh, – it was – there was – the. That it, it, the difference between like that year and like the the twelve and zero football year is that they won all those little mm-hmm. little things and they got those little breaks and then they had a similar just just thing that happened like the 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 interception of that year in that football game off the back of uh, I can't remember was it Kittle yeah yeah a George. back of Kittle and the guy picks it off in the end zone and the game's over I mean just like one little thing can right. just destroy it yeah the line is so thin between like a legendary team yep. and a really good team yep. and you guys saw that your senior year. And so, at your at, at when you're leaving your senior year, is there a dream to play in the NBA, or where were your thoughts at yeah, at that time? Yeah, absolutely. So that was one of the hardest things to swallow, right there. It was like, all right, so and this is the biggest thing with athletes right now is that um, we're breeding this culture in which athletes are just athletes. Um, they they only know that. Like the NCAA doesn't allow them to do any work. They don't allow them to do anything else. So it's a huge culture shock. It's a huge shell shock when you get done with it. Like. Well, what what am I going to do next? Mm-hmm. That next phase, and that's why you see a lot of athletes go bankrupt or get into drugs or get into bad things. And um, so it was one of those things where I remember after the Northwestern game, I'm like, "All right, Northwestern State game. I'm like, what's next?" I was so depressed. I remember talking to my high school coach, trying to figure out like, "Do I want to play? Do I ha- like what's my next steps?" I mean, and, and Todd was so good. He got me hooked up to a a sports psychologist that would graduated from Charles City. And we had conversations and, and I, and he got me back on the track. Like I just, I remember never, I didn't want to go shoot. I didn't want to go work right. out. Like all I wanted to do was go lift. And, and I, that was kind of what I did for a couple months afterwards. And then. Because I, you're identifying, you, you talked about it. You were born and bred to be an Iowa Hawkeye. Yeah. You go play four years as an Iowa Hawkeye. And then when that's all over, you're like, who am I? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Like, and I was a long shot. I was pretty frustrated at the NBA. Um, so Haluska and I, I think, are the only first team all Big Ten players that didn't get invited to Chicago or like that tryout camp. Though. And that's where I would have tested really well. Um, so it, it, it's I had the like JPT, I, I think, uh, what is it? In basketball, we did 185 pounds. I benched that 31 times. Um, Batista was the only one that beat me, and he benched it 32 times. Who was that? JP Batista from Gonzaga. Oh yeah, um, he was a big and, dude. And, I, and all the speed tests, I was with the guards. So like, I ran like as a four. I, I had the speed test of the th- uh, with the threes. I had a high vertical. You wouldn't ever known it because um, I didn't. <laughs> that wasn't my style. Like, I just I had a high vertical, um, huge wingspan at seven two wingspan. Like, I, like that would have been a huge key driver for me, but I just couldn't get in. Uh, like they kept saying like, we know what he can do. And I'm like, well, my whole life I've been told, like, you can't, you're not going to be able to accomplish it. So, like, just give me a chance, and I promise you I'll go in there and right. do what I need to do. And, and then that year, nobody plays. So, like, everybody just goes, and they do that thing where they say, all right, we're going to go to Chicago, but I'm only going to do the workout. I'm not going to play. And I'm just chomping at the bit, like, just give me an opportunity. Give me an opportunity. So then I end up going to L.A., um, lived in L.A. for about a month and a half, um, did workouts out there. It was myself, Hilton Armstrong. Nick DeWitts, who used to play at Iowa. Um, gosh, I can't remember who else was out there with us. There's one other guy. And we did workouts every single day together. Um, got in pretty good shape. Um, played with Minnesota in their summer. I did a couple workouts. Had really good workouts. Um, thought I might have a chance with Dallas. I um, uh, had a really good workout with J.J. Barrera there. And uh, actually, J.J. Redick and J.J. Barrera were going at each other. And J.J. was on my team. And we played really well together. Um, and had a really good workout there. And played really well um, in the uh, NBA Summer League. Um, so I played outstanding in practice. I wasn't, they weren't really, because they drafted two power forwards. So I played at the Timberwolves in, in that Summer League. And they drafted Craig Smith, and I can't remember the big boy from Florida. Um, and I outplayed, Craig was hurt, and I outplayed the other guy. And uh, got some spot minutes right away. Played well. I think the first game I was like 9-9 nine and nine or almost a double-double there. So I can't remember. I'm throwing out numbers. It's so long ago. And then just couldn't get over the hump. Got yeah. invited to vet camp. And then, um, so I was going to go to vet camp. But like I said, I was going to compete with two two guys um, for that one single spot. So it was essentially three of us competing for one spot. And um, we had a really good check my first year and overseas. And I'm like, ah, you know, I grew up with nothing. Like, this is more than my mom and dad make combined. Like, I'm going to go. And right. So I went overseas and played. In Belgium, right? Yep, I played my first year in Belgium. And with J- Justin Gray, we had all rooks. So we started the season 2-10. and ten. They changed the coach. We, we win like 12 games in a row, franchise set, franchise record. 
And it was Justin Gray, myself, Thomas Gardner, Squeaky Johnson from UAB. I remember Squeaky Johnson. Yeah, and we just, like, once we got the new coach, up style, like, the other guy played, like, I don't know, some weird style of basketball that I had never even heard of. Like, and then we got a, we got the Cro- a Croatian coach, and it was in your face, just, we're going to score more points than you and everything like that. And we just started blitzing people, and it was so much fun. And that was, was a, that was a shell shock, though. Yeah, what's Belgium like, going from a small-town Iowa kid to living in Belgium? Yeah, so that was a... It, it was just uh, it was so different. Um, I remember, so seven hours difference. I remember uh, going over there. Didn't know anything. I, I, I was saying I'm smart enough to know where Belgium is. I didn't know Belgium is French and Flemish. Um, and there's another little sect in there too. But everybody in the Flemish part speaks English. <laughs> Nobody in the French part speaks English. So I'm first. I'm like I go. I sign in the French part. We go. I get dropped off in a, my apartment. Um, they're like, all right, see it. See at five. I'm like, I, I don't know where I'm at. I don't know where the gym's at or anything. Like, we'll we'll send somebody to get to you. They're like, here's your car. I'm like, it's a stick. I've never driven a stick. Like, <laughs> I, I, and so I'm going to bed at like four o'clock in the morning over and living the college life still and living yep. that stuff. And so that's what uh, four plus eleven o'clock in the morning, like wow. on that side. So like trying to get my body to adjust it. So I got to get up at six to go to practice. So like. I'm not a, I'm jet lagged. I remember just all my friends are at home having fun. My girlfriend at the time was at home, everything. And I just remember like crying myself to sleep. Cause like Iowa boy going to Iowa, getting, going through six hours of practice with an hour of sleep each night for like three weeks. It was like two weeks, like just crying myself to sleep. And then finally, like I started to get acclimated at the time, get acclimated to the culture a little bit, started to find the nuances that I enjoyed. Um, started to hang out with the guys a little bit more. And, and I realized it's, it's, it's all the same when you're in between the lines. Mm-hmm. So then I spent more time in between the lines to get myself more comfortable. And then I slowly just, it, I, and I grew to love it. And that's why I stayed about 10 years over there. Yeah, I mean, you must have grown to love it because you played in Belgium, Israel, Italy, Montenegro. Is that right? Uh, so I, I, I played in the city of Montenegro. City of Montenegro. In, in, in Italy. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I'm not a geography yeah. whiz, so I saw that. I'm like, I don't, I don't totally get this. Um, so, yeah, you must have grown to love it if you've spent almost a decade of your life there. Yeah, so like when I, reti- I retired at 34, and you look back, I played nine years. Essentially, that's a fourth of my life was playing in Europe. And it, and it was like... You, it seemed like it took forever, and then you look back, and it was a blink of an eye. Like it was so quick. It was just, it was such a weird dynamic because, like, I, I, when you're there doing it, it's like, oh god, another. I mean, 100 hour weeks uh, playing basketball all the time. It's a job. It's not right. like it is in the NBA. You're not flying private and going, staying at the the West Ends. You're you're on a bus seven hours, and you're sitting. You get in, you do a little practice, and it's it's just a different environment. And it's like, there, two bad weeks, you're. See ya. And it's not like the NBA where it's guaranteed right. contract. So well, when were you at your absolute best? Um, so my f- first year in Italy, um, so I played really well. Our, I was in Capo de Orlando, so that's on, in Sicily. My house was a stone's throw from the Mediterranean Sea. Like I, I could walk out and I could hear, I could see the waves. Like that's how close we wow. were. We lived on the beach, everything. And we had a really good Tyus Edney. I mean, he was like 74 UCLA. years old. UCLA. Yeah, he was like 74 years old and everything like that, but he was a really good player. Drake Diener, uh, myself, Nick Kaner Medley, we had a squad. We were gonna we were blowing people out in uh, preseason. And then like three weeks before the season started, they're like, uh, uh, team folded. Like, what? The team folded. Um, they got caught for tax evasion or something like this. They got kicked out of the league. We're like, Okay, they're like, well, you guys can keep doing your games, but you don't have any insurance, so you get hurt, you know, you're not going to get any money more money from us. We're like, everybody's in a panic. So, yeah, I why? Saw, yeah. What just, do you do? You like, don't want to keep playing if you're not going to get paid. Yeah, and you get hurt, and then you're, you're gone, you know what I mean? So, and it was all preseason stuff. And we, and they're, they're trying to say that we couldn't sign back in Italy for a year or, <laughs> or for a, a extended period, a month or something like this. So, I ended up going to Israel, um, played really, really well there, but just hated the basketball, the people, the environment, everything's just amazing there. But it's just all one on one, and I, that's not my style of basketball. So I ended up buying myself out of my contract. Um, that was a check I didn't like to write, and uh, I came back home. I didn't have any place to play, so I was living in my place in Iowa City. And Thanksgiving Day, I got a call and said, "Hey, I got a spot in Biella. The money's half of what you were making, but go." 
It'll be a really good step. It's a it's a struggling team, but they're all young and they have a really good team. So I go into a team. It's Joe Smith. Um, I played Division two basketball. Really good point guard. Reese Gaines from Louisville. Um, uh, Jonas Drepko who plays on the Golden State Warriors right now. Yeah, um, he's like their key to the bench right yeah, now. Yeah, huge. I mean, he was 19 at the time. Big six eleven Swede. Um, J- uh, James Gist from Maryland, freak athlete. Um, <laughs> myself. Uh, and then we had just a bunch of other good guys and we ended up going, um, and I had a little point guard. So I'm a pick and roll guy over in Europe and, uh, I had a little point guard that was just awesome in pick and roll. He's like Steve Nash. Like he looked just like, he looked like flea uh, it was, <laughs> from it was, the red hot chili peppers. Yeah, it was just so much fun. So him and I had a really good dynamic. So there are two and six. We ended up going, uh, making the playoffs it was the first time ever. Cause they just come up. And then we end up going, we beat Rome, who had like seven NBA guys, ex-NBA guys. And we beat them in the game five and upset them there. They're, I think our budget on our team was like 4 million euro net. And their budget was like 28 million euro. Holy sp- we, we upset them. Then we go play Milan, who is supposed to be the best team. And we get the game. We have, we win game one. We Essentially what it is, we, we choke at the last second. I can't remember what happens. Um, somebody turns up all over and they get a layup to lose the game. And uh, else we would have beat them and upset them. And their budget was like $33 million. Like wow. they had a they had a squad too. So it would have been a huge game. And then so the rest of the guys, like Jonas goes to the NBA, um, they kind of disbanded the team. But it was that year it kind of set my tone in Italy. And then after that, it was just, I mean, it was easy pickings. So you do you think at your best you were an NBA guy? I, yeah, I think so. I, I could play at it. Um, I would play right now in the NBA a lot better than it was 10 years ago. Um, they move a lot more to the small ball. I mean, when P.J. Tucker and uh, those guys are playing the five, I mean, I, I'm 6'7". Yeah. I played at 262. So, like, I played against Mozgov, um, the big seven. Timothy Mozgov, yeah, yeah. Mo- So, I'm Swiss-American. So, I'm American-Swiss, which said I played on their national team. And the day, the day before I blew out my shoulder um, – Clint Capella and I um, were on the national team, and we upset Russia. And him and I guarded Moskov. I think we held him like six and six. Um, I mean, he's seven two two forty. There's a difference when you're six seven two two sixty two, and you're like, in, and it's all between your ass and your thighs. Like, I mean, that's what. I, so, and I guarded the one to the five in Europe. So yep. it was just one of those good environments where I fit in better with the NBA now than I would have 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just a bigger style of basketball back then. And now they're moving that quick three point line, everything like this. So when did you think about joining the Swiss national basketball team? Cause you played on them for five years, 2010 yeah. through 14. Yes. So, um, the, the unique dynamic about, uh, European basketball is that you, uh, the, it's all, if you're Bosman, so European, or if you're American, they have what did you say, Bosman? Bosman, it's like what they call a nationalized citizen in Europe. So okay. like EU, so you can go play a cross country. So they have these set number of pit players that you can have. So in Italy, when I was playing, like in the prime, um, you could have like two Americans and you can have four Bosmans. So people usually like the high dollar amount. Uh, they spend the high dollar on the Americans. So now I'm one of six instead of one of two. So I did all the research. I um, spoke fluent Italian, talk, my, taught myself Italian. Did the research. Both my both sides of my family are from Switzerland. Presented to the government. Um, had a bunch of connections. Reach out to the government. Everything like this, and ended up um, acquiring the Swiss passport, which is one of the hardest passports to get. And uh, so then, one of the requirements was that as I play on the national team. Um, so then I played five years with them. And uh, so I got to play with Tabo. I got to play with Clint, Clint Capella. Wow. Like from the Houston Rockets. Oh yeah, I mean he's like uh, seven feet tall and he runs the floor. It, it, I've never seen anybody jump as quick as he can. Like it, it is like it, he is the perfect player for that team. Uh, it's so fun. Like I would be, I'd be playing and I'd, I'd get by my my guy and somebody would help. I'd just throw the ball up in the air and then just start running because he'd just go up and dunk it. And it was just, it was so fun to do. Some of the things him and James Harden are doing on like yeah. the pick and roll are so fun to watch. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, so Thabo Cephalosha, Clint Capella, Greg Bruner, who else is on that team that uh, you'd know? So we had – Thabo didn't even play with us when we upset Russia. Um, so we had myself, Thabo. We had Dusan, who was a little two-guard. Um, he was a naturalized citizen uh, from – his parents were from Serbia, and they during the war they migrated to uh, um, to Switzerland. So we had us three, and then I don't know – and Derek Stockerper. He was another American-born Swiss kid. Uh, four man, three four, and uh, he didn't actually play on that one either. So we didn't have a single guy that was like played in any top leagues. 
Um, we're playing against five and four NBA guys. Um, and we're blasting. We get them down like 24 and then we ended up losing or we ended up winning by two or three, um, at the end. But like, it was just a huge upset. Like Switzerland's going to first time ever playing in Euro basket. We up the upset them. We got to play Italy. We got to win one of our next three games and we're in next day. I go up for a shot and just get my arm like pulled back, Ugh. snap everything in my shoulder. Oh. Same practice. And it was supposed to be a no, no contact practice. So we were just we were working against the two three zone, and a guy just snap pull my arm from behind against the two three zone, and then Clint Capello gets hurt at the same practice, just pulls a groin. So then he's done. So then they end up getting beat by like forty against Italy, getting beat by fifty against Russia, and, and that was it. Yeah, it was it. So it was one of those hard things to deal with. But what a cool experience, though. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's 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 awesome, but it's tough also. So it was nice my first year because I didn't have a we I got married. Um, on July, uh, July 24th, if my wife listens to this, I still remember. And then two, she'll listen. Yeah, two days later, I, I'm on a plane and I'm going to Switzerland um, because I got to play on the national team. The hard thing, like the NBA, is we play half the number of games um, and our season's twice as long. Hmm. So it's grind, grind, grind. Right. Like two practices a day. It's not like the the NBA in that aspect. So when you're gone, I mean, that adds a whole another month and a half to your season. So your season's usually August to middle of June if, you, if you're in the playoffs. Now you're talking beginning of July, you got to get over. You have like right. three weeks off, and it's just a grind. And I think that's kind of, as I got a little bit older, my body started to break down a little bit. And when I hurt my shoulder, I could have maybe gone back and played, but the, and, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Wolf um, from Iowa City is one of the better shoulder surgeons in the world. Um, he's like, here's your... Here's the truth. You can go play. You can make more money. You get hit wrong. Like, it's very small chance of it, but you might not be able to play catch with your kids ever again. And at that point, I'd done well and saved well. Um, it was more about, like, I want to have that experience right. helping my kids get to the next level. And Raising your kids in Iowa, quality yeah. of life, that type yep, of thing. Yep, So, Well, Greg, the way we end every episode here on the Moonlight Graham Show is with the five big questions. Okay. First question is, who's your all-time favorite teammate? Oh God, I'm gonna. Get, people are gonna hate me. Yep. Um, you know, I, I love everybody I've played with. Um, I, I gotta go, Jeff. Um, he's like my little brother. Um, he would say that I would be his little brother. It's just, uh, growing up 30 minutes from him. Um, we hated each other growing up. Like we got seventh grade, we got in fights at basketball practice. They had to stop us. <laughs> um, like they wouldn't. Like, we were both point guards at the time. Um, and it was just one of those things, like. You go to respect somebody. Um, I, expect, I like people that don't have all the natural gifts. Um, I, I have a lot of natural gifts, but I don't have them all. He has a lot of. He doesn't have them all either. And he, he, you look at him. He looks like anybody else on the court. And he's just had that. That he just has that that next step of that ability to get get what he wanted done. And I, and I respect that. Um, and playing and growing up with him and and kind of fighting the fires that we had to fight when we were at Iowa for the, all the shit that happened there right. um, with the the scandals and all that stuff. Like, you, you, that was one of the things that you can never take away from us. Yeah, you probably played more games with Jeff Horner yeah. than anyone else. Yep. Yeah, it's, if you really think about it, I mean, we played since um, sophomore year of high school all the way through. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool to have those type of relationships. The bonds and the brotherhood that's formed on a court and through the fires of battle, you know, you can't replace that with anyone with anything else. Second question then, Greg, is when you look back on your career now, what's one memory that you have that reminds you about everything that you love about the game of basketball? Hmm. Wow. wow. I'm trying to think what it is. You know, uh, it's kind of cliche here, but like, I one of the last games of my professional career, um, my uh, I had I had gotten hurt, kind of got taken out of the roster a little bit, and it was down. It was just frustrating. Um, and then I came back and I had a huge game to kind of get us to the next level into the playoffs. And I remember looking at my son who was out at the game. It was a huge celebration on the court, and then looking at my son who was in the middle of it. He's maybe two at the time. And he doesn't remember it now, but like thinking to myself, like, that's like, I'm trying, I want to teach you, I want you to learn how sports can be used to make you a better person and how you should use sports and not use them to just to participate or just to have, get a trophy or this, you can use everything you learn in sports or the things that are going to make you better as a person and growing up. And, and as you, and it will help you achieve as you, as you get older. And 
that was probably the, the one thing that I look back and like, that's worth it to me. Like everything I did, the, the, the bumps, bruises, and the accolades, the paychecks, it, it's all the time in spent for that. But like now it's passing that lineage down. Like, I don't even know if I want my kids to play basketball, but just how they can use sports the right way to mm-hmm. teach them the right things. That's cool. What still nags at you from your career? Uh, damn Northwestern State. Game. <laughs> it's still to this day. It's like, what if? Um, and that's, I, I really just wish I could see what if, like where we could have gone. Yeah. Um, that one's that's that one's hard to swallow. Um, and it and it is so Iowa to have it go out that way. And that's the <laughs> hardest part about it. It's just like everything was set up for a great run. And it's just I I could have handled getting beat by forty. Um, and that's fine, but having it go the way it did. Up 16 with six yeah. minutes to go. You, Jeff, and Adam go out of the yeah. game, and, and it kind of slips through your hands right there. Yep. Yeah. What are you most proud of? Um, you know, uh, I no one has ever – I've never been the first pick for anything. Um, I, I was a waste of scholarship. Everybody thought I would never play. Um, I got there, and – People thought I'd be average, um, uh, you know, and, and it's just one of those things. I love, I love the underdog feel. I love it when everybody else gets all the the press, and then I'll just keep working, and and I'm gonna beat you in the long run. And that was my my whole mentality. That was what I wanted. That was what I thrived on, and and that's what it is. Is that that being able to maintain the confidence to know that even though nobody else thinks you can do it, you're gonna get it done. And that's probably where where I'm I'm the most proud of because I I had all the cards against me um, growing up and and kind of coming out of what I what I did um, and people took a lot of chances on me and over time it just I slowly built up that repertoire in which I I finally got the where I needed to be and mm-hmm. it just took time and uh, um, but for the most part it's just just knowing that I never really had the 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 accolades or anything like what everybody thought everybody else should be. I was always kind of second choice and it was a good feeling. What a great answer for a show, a podcast that features the underdogs in sports (laughs) for a guy that just said what always drove you was that underdog feel. Love that. I love that. My, my boss is, she, she's, I think she's figured that out now um, because she's, whenever she tells me I can't do something, it's like, all right, well now he's going to go. He's going to double down on this now. (laughs) What's the best advice you've ever received? Um, you know, uh, I remember like my freshman year, I played against a high, big name person. Um, I won't divulge or anything like that. And I played scared. Um, and I don't know if any of you know my, and nobody here knows my dad. Um, everybody in Charles City would laugh at this story. My dad's a farmer, um, six, six, two, three bills. He's lost a lot of weight now, but big farmer, like built like me. Yep. Um, and I remember he, he grabbed me by the throat, slammed me against the locker, and he said, who's scary, me or him? And then from that moment on, I was like, nobody's going to be more scared, like, scare me more than my father. And, yep. like, it wasn't like he wasn't trying to beat me or anything like that. He right. just wanted to send me a message. Like, yep. never be scared of anybody or anything in your life. And and because there's no point. And, like, don't play timid. And from that moment on, like, my whole mentality on basketball was I want to break everybody I play. Like, I don't care who it is. I'm going to hit you. I'm going to rub you. I'm going to run against you. I'm going to do anything I can just to feel that that when that hope is gone. Because, like, you can feel it in the game. Like, you hit them enough, and then finally you hit them once, and it's just like you just feel the body <laughs> give up. And it's just like, all right, it's Got like, now you're mine the rest of the day. Do you think that was the moment in your sports career, at least, when you went from being a boy to being a man? Yeah, I think it was. And, um, and it – like today's standard, that's abuse. And I'm like, I look at it, I'm like, that's ridiculous. That was like one of the best lessons of my life. And I'm like, that's the happiest moment of my life because then it was like my dad finally realized like, all right, I'm done with him. I can't teach him anything more because um, we he taught us um, growing up, all that stuff. It was just one of those things like I can't teach him anymore. I, 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 I made that threshold from a boy to a man, like you just said. Mm-hmm. And and from that moment on, I don't think he ever got into me. He ever, never yelled at me, never said anything really about a game. Um, it was... He was just proud. That's so, so cool. 
That is so cool, man. Well, Greg, thank you for coming on the podcast. One of the best Iowa high school basketball players, even though he didn't make the state tournament. <laughs> All-time leading, re- leading rebounder for the Iowa Hawkeyes in a nine-year professional career over in Europe, part of the Swiss national team. Proud to have you on the Moonlight Graham Show. Well, thank you, thank you. So I'm hoping my boys and uh, my daughter probably be the best out of all of them, but I'm hoping they'll, they'll, they'll continue that, that name on, on for me. There you go. Thank all you. Right. This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat-out great stories in sports.